It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm a member of the class of 17. The university gave me an honorary doctorate. I'm very pleased to uh, join the university in, in that way. Uh, this is a very special to me. Ken and I have worked together on uh, Asia Pacific relations for a few decades. Uh, Ken is a uh, actually from Southern Ontario. He went to Glendon College. He uh, took his uh, master's degree at INSEAD. He took his doctorate at uh, uh, the Sorbonne, uh, the unit of the Sorbonne. He taught at Laval. Uh, he's quite fluent in French, more fluent than most people in Ottawa are. Uh, Ken is uh, uh, started as an academic. Uh, as I did. I once taught law at UBC. Uh, incidentally, I didn't go to Simon Fraser because you didn't exist when I went to university. Uh, Ken is uh, uh, someone who uh, began his international business and finance uh, background as a researcher, uh, joined Deutsche Bank, uh, became vice chair Asia for Deutsche Bank based in Tokyo, and from there uh, was recruited by Goldman Sachs, became Vice Chairman uh, Asia Pacific for Goldman Sachs. He's a professional economist. He's turned himself into one of the leading uh, businessmen in finance, uh, investment, uh, commodity trading. He has a, a group called Starfort. Starfort, incidentally, is a very Canadian name. Uh, Ken, I, I admired your choice of that name. Starfort is the way the British built their forts in uh, Canada. For example, in Churchill, there is a star fort. It was built in the form of, uh, of a star, of a five-point star. And uh, Ken has uh, uh, experienced and developed a network of people uh, in finance, in the banks, in the investment houses, uh, and at the political level throughout Asia and throughout the world, in fact. Uh, finally, Ken is uh, a member of the Federal Minister of Finance Advisory Council uh, on, on the economy. And uh, so if you want to ask him about the Canadian economy, Real estate prices, where rents are going, where interest rates are going. He knows how to finesse the answers. So Ken, with that, let me call on you. There you go. Turn this on. There we go. Jack, that was such a wonderful introduction. <laughs> My mother was here, she would tell me to sit down and ask me to keep talking. <laughs> um, I, uh, <clears throat> started my career, I became an economist, <clears throat> and uh, that was a great job. The problem with being an economist, you have to guess all the time, right? <laughs> what will real estate prices be? Where will interest rates go? Um, and <clears throat> you probably heard this story about uh, this economist uh, was out walking in uh, countryside New Zealand one spring. And as he was hiking about, he came across a great flock of sheep. And this was spring, there were many baby lambs, and he thought these baby lambs were so cute, he wanted to take one home to his daughter. So he finally found the shepherd, and he said, uh, Mr. Shepherd, if I, can, um, if I can guess how many sheep you have, in your flock. Will you let me take one? Shepard looked at this guy, he said, this city slicker probably can't even park a bicycle, let alone calculate how many, figure out how many sheep I have. He said, sure, sure, go ahead. So economist looked, he made a few calculations, he said, I, I think you have 179, 179 sheep. Shepard said, what? You have 179 sheep. He said, exactly, but how, how'd you figure that out? He said, you know, Good education, I can make calculations. 
So I'm going to take one of your animals now, right? Yeah, yeah go ahead. He picked up one of the animals and he started walking off. And the shepherd said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, stop, stop, stop. If I can guess what your profession is, we give me the animal back. The guy said to himself, this fluke will never figure that out, really. He said, sure, go ahead. Uh, I think you're an economist. What? I think you're an economist. Why is that? He said, because you picked up my dog. <laughs> Um, uh, you know, so that's why I also quit my career as an economist. <laughs> and then I, I became a banker, as, as Jack said, and um, <clears throat> I don't know if you heard the story about the banker and the business person, the business man. Um, they were working on a deal day and night, day and night. Finally, uh, Friday afternoon, they closed the deal. They went out for a celebrated over dinner. And on the way back to the hotel, they saw, uh, they passed in front of a travel agency and in the window there was a sign that said, uh, I think it's in San Francisco, trips to Tahiti, $500. This man said, that looks like a really great deal. Let's do it. The banker said, okay. Saturday morning, they returned to the travel agency when it was open, they plunked down their $500. Bang, they got slammed over the head where both of them were knocked out. Two days later, they woke up somewhere in the Pacific, rowing a boat, I guess to Tahiti. And the businessman said to, I was the optimist, said to the banker, um, this isn't quite what I expected, but maybe they'll fly us back. <laughs> the banker said, they didn't the last time. <laughs> so that's when I decided it was probably better for me to end my career in banking and go into business. Um, it's great to be at uh, Simon Fraser this morning. I, I know that everyone at UBC is at UBC because they didn't get into Simon Fraser, right? <laughs> um, and there's so much going on in the world, it's a little difficult to know where to start. But why don't we start with the world economy? and. Um, think through some of the issues that are facing the world economy and then maybe what some of the policy changes coming up will be or could be and then what are the consequences of that and then I know you all want to make a lot of money so maybe we can share a few ideas on uh, uh, what will happen, what may happen in markets as we look ahead and I'm most of all looking forward to uh, discussion with you. Um, it's the first time since 1980 that we have synchronized global growth. It doesn't mean it's coordinated, it just happens that way that Europe, even Japan, America, China, India, uh, even some of the countries in Latin America that have been in so much trouble, Russia, all these countries are getting an uplift in their economies at the same time. It's not a big uplift. It's, except for China, where they're you know, still generating six, seven, six and a half, seven percent growth. India, this year, a bad year, relatively for them, they've come off a bit for a few reasons, maybe five and a half percent growth. But if we take Europe, it's come back from nothing over these last few years, so 1.7, 1.8% growth this year, Spain is three, even Italy has been growing, just the sixth quarter of growth, I think the first time since 2000. France is growing a bit, 1.8, 1.9%. Uh, Japan, nothing great, but in an economy where the labor force is contracting and 26% of the population is over 65, uh, it's tough to get growth. Um, particularly when you have a government that's not really focused on the economy, it's more focused on questions of politics uh, in the region in Japan's own particular political situation. So Japan will maybe get one and a half, 1.4, 1.6% growth this year. <clears throat> the US, two and a quarter, and that's with Trump getting nothing done. Imagine that if he actually did get something done other than tweeting about football players. Um, 
tax cut, for example, or an infrastructure uh, effort up in money. I think the markets are largely discounted. And any significant policy initiatives on the economy from the Trump administration, we've been talking a lot at the moment about um, tax reform. You'll remember, maybe you don't remember, but the last big tax reform in America was almost a third of a century ago, uh, 1986. It took two years to get through Congress, and Reagan spent, President Reagan, who was president at the time, he spent virtually every day for two years pushing it. Um, so I think it's pretty problematic that uh, we aren't going to see a big, big tax overhaul in the U.S. Canada's got the best growth in the G7. So it's okay, and I think okay is okay. Um, interest rates are still relatively low. Inflation is pretty benign so far, we can discuss that. Um, oil prices, well, WTI has gone back over $50. It's still relatively cheap, particularly in real terms in terms of efficiency with which we use energy compared to 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, there's still lots of slack in the global economy. Um, even in the U.S., where the central bank said we're close to full employment, actually that's just looking at the official number of, un of unemployment, which is a quite narrow definition. If you look at broader numbers and you look at how the participation rate has fallen from five or six points in the last few years, uh, the real unemployment rate is probably somewhere around 7.2, 7.3%, so there's still uh, capacity there. Um, policy makers on the whole are pretty balanced. No one's doing anything crazy on the fiscal side. Um, and um, so that brings us to the question of what monetary policy would we like as we move ahead because it's usually central banks that create recessions, right? They raise interest rates too much, they want to slow the 1981, uh, 1980, 1982, Paul Volcker, no bombs, pushed the US economy into a recession to try to break the inflation. Um, other times, uh, central bankers uh, raise rates too much, too fast. And, and rolls over. If we look at the leading indicators for virtually all of the economies, with really one or two exceptions, they're all indicating the leading indicators lead the world economy by nine to 12 months, typically. They're all indicating uh, that we've got well into next year the same type of growth that we're getting now. Um, you know, everything could go wrong, but that's the picture I'm looking at at the moment. Um, this country adopted, uh, with the election of the new government, a more activist uh, Keynesian fiscal policy. Um, the theory was that um, with interest rates at levels we've never seen them before, it's a good idea to borrow money. Uh, real interest rates, um, when the new government was elected, were below zero. In other words, you were getting paid to borrow money. Give an example of how cheap money is. Last week, Austria raised 100-year money for 2.1%. In other words, people put money on the table to get paid a, a coupon at 2.1% for the next 100 years. That's pretty heroic, right? They raised $5.6 billion. More interesting, it was 10 times oversubscribed. In other words, it was people wanted to put up $56 billion. Um, so, you know, when, when they're selling ties for 25% of the regular price, it's a good time to buy them. And that's what's going on. And <clears throat> so the, the issue now is your central banks raise rates too high too fast. I say too high too fast because one of the negatives of the last few years since the U.S. economy imploded and the financial markets crashed um, is that we've seen a continuous buildup of debt in the world economy. And one of the reasons that there was a crash is that there was already a buildup of debt and the Fed raised interest rates too high, too fast, but the rates on too strong. <clears throat> um, we've been told permanently 
everywhere around the world that we're in a period of delivering, of reducing the debt. That's not happening. Debt today is about 45% gross debt in the world, households, corporations, financial sector, government, is about 45% higher than it was in 2007 before the U.S. crash. Um, and everyone says debt, well, they always think it's government debt. And government debt, with very few exceptions, is not the issue. With the exception of Japan and maybe one or two other countries, government debt everywhere is not much, is around 25% or lower than the total outstanding stock of gross debt. Take this country. Uh, household sector debt is levels we've never seen before. 167, uh, 1.67 times annual income. Um, or 167, 167% of GDP, right? Um, government debt in this country is around uh, 21% of GDP. So, this the it's how this debt is going to behave as interest rates are raised, I think is really the issue we have to focus on. Um, up until now, central bankers have been very cautious, very careful. Um, remember the Fed keeps telling us they're data dependent. <laughs> The Chinese central bank, and it's important to focus on the Chinese central bank, is China is delivering 40% of world growth. We often don't think of that. We think the U.S. is a big engine, but it's been China, the big engine, driving the world economy. And that's 35 to 40% of growth directly is coming from China, but also there's a lot of growth indirectly coming from China. You take countries in Asia, or East Asia, virtually all of them, indeed all of them, have trade surpluses with China. So that means China is exporting some of its growth to those economies, right? So it could well be, I've seen IMF simulations that China is doing 46, producing 46, 47% of total world growth, growth currently. So although when I read the media, there's very little focus on, on monetary policy and fiscal policy of Chinese authorities. We should actually be at least as focused on that as we are on what the US is doing, what Europe is doing, what Japan is doing. Uh, so, central bankers have this problem. They think we're running, starting to, we will start to run into an economy where we have no excess capacity, and if we have no excess capacity, then we start to put pressure on, on, on prices. Um, they're also quite concerned that they've expanded their money supply so much that somehow that could trigger inflation. As you know from your first course in economics, um, the monetary mass times, uh, you know, talking here, uh, I'm so frustrated. The monetary, mass, <laughs> the monetary mass times velocity equals output times the inflation rate. MV equals MP. Uh, M, MV equals PQ. So what we've seen since the U.S. crash is a huge increase in hemp. But what we've also seen is an equally, if not larger, decrease in velocity, the speed at which money is turning over in the economy. And so if your MV actually shrinks, then your economy can't grow very much or you get into deflation. If your economy output stays stable, then you have to go into deflation. So we've been really around that. That's basically where we've been the last few years. And what, well, that's partly the result because people are still afraid after the crash. So many people got into trouble. So many companies went bankrupt. So many people lost their homes. Think of what's been going on in Europe, for example. And secondly, the banking system, the credit creation function in the banking system is broken by the crash. Remember how hard it was to raise money in 2009, 10, 11, 12, 13. The banks had money coming out their ears, but they wouldn't lend it to people. But they'd only lend it to people who didn't need it. Right? Um, they said they go to the banks, and maybe I shouldn't say this in this building, but they always take the umbrella away from you when it rains. Um, so the monetary authorities in in the U.S. and starting to lose banking, particular, but more broadly at the ECB, 
they're afraid that this big massive monetary policy, the monetary money that's out there, liquidity with volatility, uh, velocity having dropped so much, that velocity all of a sudden might turn up. And if that were to happen, then, then you could see a sharp rise in prices. There's no sign that that's going to happen. And I, I, I question that maybe some people could do research on at some point. Surely there will be research. I just wonder in our developed country economies, where the demographics mean that we have a much older population than, say, 30 years ago. I gave you an example of Japan. If people react the same way to monetary signals, say people 70, do they react to monetary signals the same way people 30? And if your center of demographic uh, gravity is, say, 35, or your center of demographic gravity is 60, does the economy behave in the same way to different monetary signals? Uh, I haven't seen any conclusive research on that, but intuitively, you would think it doesn't, right? I mean, if you're 70, how many more cars are you going to buy? Right? How many more uh, marathon shoes are you going to buy? How many more apartments or houses will you buy in your life when you're 70 or 65? So I, I think that even though rates come down, People, when they're that age, they're more concerned about, am I going to have enough money for the next, whatever, 20 years? I'm an optimist in the next 100 years. Um, will I have money to give to my children? Because I'd like to give them something. I think they're more the preoccupations people have. And then they say, well, I'm going to move from a, a big house into a smaller apartment. And I, I didn't need those 47 t-shirts anyway, did I? There's no place to keep them. In my big library collection, I'm going to donate it to SFU. And so people slim down, and, and so their behavior relative to monetary policy changes. So watch carefully at how quickly they raise rates. And I thought the last meeting of the Fed was interesting because they said, yes, we will still be data dependent. But they also said, we need to raise interest rates. Well, they've said before they'd raise interest rates if they saw signs of inflation. Actually, inflation's come down a lot. Um, so they're now talking themselves into what I think could be trouble for us. They're talking themselves into this idea. We have to raise rates so that in the next recession, rates are high enough we can bring them down and offset the recession. That's the, that could well provoke the recession that they want to offset. Um, so I would watch that not very carefully. Um, Senator Austin mentioned that um, I'd be working on the advisory board of the government about it's called the Economic Growth Council, trying to figure out ways, um, ideas that could help the economy, help put the economy on a higher trajectory of growth. Uh, and Secondly, generate more inclusive growth. Because you all know better than I do that one of the, another characteristic with the rise of debt is the increase in inequality that's been occurring in developed economies and deep around the world in the last, uh, not just the last few years, it's been documented, it's going back to the to the 1980s. And we are now at inequality levels between the top and the bottom tier, if you like, in the top uh, portion of the income scale that we haven't seen since the late 1920s. Um, so how do you generate more inclusive growth? So we've been working, trying to work on some big ideas. Um, one idea is, uh, I had this experience, I was in the airplane recently flying into Toronto. And the lady beside me, I started talking to her, and where do you work? I work in Toronto, et cetera, et cetera. Where do you live? I live in Lambeth, Ontario. I don't know if anyone knows where Lambeth, Ontario is. It's a small village, basically, southwest 
southeast of London, Ontario. And uh, you, uh, I don't understand. She said, yeah, I commute every day. I said, how long does it take? Said, Two and a half hours each day. That's 25 hours a week. And I said, what's the story? Why do you live in Lambeth and work in Toronto? She said, because housing prices in, in Lambeth are 40% of what they are in Toronto. And we can't afford them. But we can't afford to live in Toronto. And I say, so you take the, was there a fast train? You drop your car off? She said, no, there's no fast train. I drive. And she said, in our village, there are 17 people commuting to Toronto every day. So what, what does that tell you? And you have the same issue here. I mean, not on that scale. It just tells you that over the last 20 years, this country has not invested in infrastructure. Uh, so one of the ideas that I pushed strongly in the advisory board um, was the creation of, of what I call CEBA, Canada Infrastructure Bank. Um, the estimates are that the infrastructure gap is $750 billion currently, and if we think of the infrastructure we'll need for the future, for example, we will need 5G. Access to 5G at affordable rates for every house in the country. At affordable rates, not the rates we're paying at the moment. We are at 5G at the moment. Um, if you think of how we have to, there's so much digitalization that's going to occur in our infrastructure. Um, so that, that adds even more to the 750. And I thought, uh, with interest rates so low, a great time to actually create a bank and run it as a bank. Um, other people have liked to see things on a smaller scale, and then there's, you know, the interests of various groups in the bureaucracy, but the infrastructure bank has been, uh, legislation has passed, it's been funded, and we'll see where that goes. Um, I'd like it to be a lot more ambitious, I'd like to see the provinces own part of the equity of the bank. I'd like to see the municipalities own part of the equity of the bank. I'd like to see it issue debt uh, to Canadians so that everyone uh, can be an owner of this. I'd like to see there's talk about privatizing the airports, about et cetera, et cetera. I would take all the airports and the ports, put them in two separate companies, and inject them into the infrastructure bank to create a substantial balance sheet of which against which they can start to raise a lot of money. Um, but, you know, I'm a, I'm a banker, so I, an investment banker, so I tend to think that way. Um, another um, area that we have to think of is the technological change that's happening. And if we were in the city in 1900, the streets would have been teeming with horses. In 1915, there were virtually none. I believe we're going through the same type of technological change today the same impact on our economy. Um, I, I've seen studies um, that up to 20% of the jobs in the world are somehow related to transportation. Uh, when you go, when you call Uber, I don't know if you use Uber in Vancouver, but when you call Uber in five or six, seven, eight, ten years, the car that will come will have no driver. And you'll punch in the GPS coordinates to where you're going, you put in your credit card. Um, but it's not only that, that car will have an electric engine. Electric engines have, for cars, motor cars, have 14 moving parts. A gas combustion, combustion engine has a 562 moving parts. So the cost of making an electric engine is just dramatically slower, uh, lower. So that means more jobs are going to disappear. I was at Siemens the other day, and they had a factory they showed me where they have seven workers, seven people working. So three shifts of seven, they produce 1.5 million electric motors a year. Seven, seven. People. I was at SKF in Sweden uh, three weeks ago. 
they said, how can we produce ball bearings in a much more efficient way? So they got together some big brains in AI. They managed, they created a new factory, and they only spent 18 months figuring out how to do this and created a new factory, which today employs one quarter of the workers for two and a half times the output. So this is what, this is now. This is starting now. Um, so another big issue that the country faces is how to have a more resilient workforce. How we can invest in, in, in our workforce so that people can adapt to these changes and deal with these changes and capitalize on these changes and, and grow from these changes. Otherwise, you know, we're on the defensive. We become victims of these changes. Um, so that's a, that's a second area uh, where we've spent a lot of time thinking about and making proposals to the government. The third area is that investment in this country, cap, private sector capital investment, has been weak. It's been weak in all the G7 countries after the U.S. crash, but other countries bounced back better than we did. R&D has been weak also. Um, so we've been thinking about that, and you know, many people say, oh, it's because taxes are so high. Well, actually, our real marginal effective tax rate is the lowest in the G20, is 17.7%. And I, I run three or four companies, and I can tell you, if we think an investment is important, we're going to make the investment regardless of the tax rate of 17.7, real effective tax rate of 7, marginal rate of 17.7 .7 or 19 or 20. That's that's not going this way is to make it, uh, that, that decision. So there's something more going on. Um, I think one of the issues that we might think about, that would be interesting for people to do research on, is given that such a large portion of our economy is controlled by companies outside of Canada. Does that lead to less investment in R&D in the country? Does that let our foreign companies <coughs> own their most advanced factories here? Their most, so I think those issues are things to look at. And we all know that where there's headquarters, there tends to be, where the, head, the city where there are headquarters of companies, you get more investment, you get better paying jobs. So working to see how we can attract, as I know some of you are doing, more headquarters, corporate headquarters for our economy is important. And I, with regard to investment, we also have to think how to attract more foreign investment. One of the biggest sources of foreign investment over the next two decades is going to be China. And how do we deal with that? Um, you remember this company called Nexon, an oil company, an energy company from Alberta? I don't know if anyone is. Is anyone here related to Nexon? Okay, I'll be right. This is a third level, a third tier company. What's well, a third tier company? Three quarters of, this, of its assets are, were outside of Canada. And the Chinese were willing to pay $6 billion more than it was worth. What's wrong with that? Great. If someone's willing to buy a third tier company for me at $6 billion more than it's worth, I'll, I'll, I love to sell them every, all the time, every day. Um, but that, what troubles me there is that it was such a psychodrama for the country. And for days, for weeks, it was headlines in the newspaper. Uh, so I think we have to come to terms with this. Um, China has a different system than you do. It's not going to change because we tell them to change it. China is too big to bully, and it's too old as it is. We have to deal with the reality. And the reality is that different countries have different systems, and we're going to have to somehow work with that um, and figure out how to handle that, how to deal with that. So one of the fourth related objective I had on the advisory board was to encourage the government to engage with China 
for a free trade and investment agreement to join the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Um, and I think we've made progress on both fronts. We've joined the AIB, uh, and we saw the Prime Minister, when he was in China, make a commitment to re-engage on, on trade and investment. And I think in the weeks ahead, you'll start to see more um, talk about that, given in the context that we're, I guess, Ottawa and much of the rest of the country totally preoccupied with what happens in the NAFTA agreement or whatever. I'm not terribly concerned. I am concerned, but I mean, I think we will have a NAFTA afterwards. It will have a dispute uh, resolution mechanism attached to it. Um, I understand USTR has done all kinds of scenarios about increasing local content regulations. For example, in automobiles at the moment, uh, the agreement is that 62.5% local content is considered a car produced in North America. And the Americans were thinking, well, what if we raise that to 65% or even 67.5%? But the reality is, at the moment, producers are 75% local content is what we have currently. So they finally backed off that I hear internally because they said, you know, however high we raise it, we're already beyond that now, so we don't you know why if I even bring it up. The, the American issue on NAFTA is not with Canada. If you net out energy, they have a big trade service service. They have a huge service account service service. So really it's it's about Mexico. Mexico, Germany, Japan, China, and Ireland, these five countries represent 82% of the U.S. trade deficit. Of course, the U.S. never tells us that they have a $260 billion service account deficit. We sort of brush that aside when we talk to them about the trade deficit. But those five countries, and so, are, are the issue, and you've heard Trump say a lot of things, I mean, not there are an adjective around it, uh, with, with, about Germany. Uh, he'll be going to China again. Uh, he'll be going to China for his first trip in, as president in November. We had a very cheeky thing, and, and Trump had a very good first visit meeting a few months ago in Florida. It was a sort of get to know you session. Um, and this will be a working meeting, the meeting in Beijing in November, which comes about a month after the 18th or 19th party congress where Xi Jinping will be uh, reconfirmed as, as president for the, for the next five years. I, I think you in Vancouver, you understand this more than most people in the country, indeed in North America, what's happening across the Pacific. Just imagine this morning you weren't in Vancouver, we and we're standing up and we're looking at the world and we had our back to the water, in other words, our back to Vancouver. What do we see? Well, we see four million people, right? Central Asia, Russia, Eastern Europe, Southeast Asia, South Asia, Middle East, into Africa. And we see that's a part of the world that's growing. And we see that's a part of the world where we as China, speaking in terms, in those terms, we can contribute a lot to sustain that growth and increase the quality of that growth um, infrastructure. China's just done an enormous infrastructure build-up over the last 25 years. It's not complete yet, but it will taper off over the next decade. I was traveling with the founder of Wipro in China a few months ago, and we arrived at Kunming. And then we went from Kunming to Yinjiang. I said, wow, Yinjiang has an airport. It's better than, Yinjiang is a small town, right? It, it, better than anything we have in India. And I said, well, um, China's in, constructing 170 new airports over the next decade. I said, we're going to be lucky to get five done. So, this enormous build-out of infrastructure, roads, airports, ports, telecom, sewers, hospital, 
uh, low-end housing. You see the government's going to announce they're building 100,000 new low-end rental units just in Beijing over the next five years. This has created um, an economy that's much more dynamic, more productive. Uh, there's a lot of talk that the electronics industry can be shifted out of China's wages go up. Uh, people who produce um, computers, notebook computers, laptop computers, ink pads, they work on the basis of what they call 95-5. That is that 95% of the people who come into a store anywhere in the world to buy a computer, that they produce it and have it in the store five days after the computer is taken out of the store. In other words, the replacement is there within five days. So you can imagine the very complex supply chain management that that has implies as they're sourcing parts from around Asia and central to that is the infrastructure. Um, so China's created these great infrastructure companies. It understands how infrastructure has dramatically increased growth short-term, mid-term, and the quality of growth long-term. And so with this one road, or one belt, one road project, basically the idea is to build out the infrastructure across Asia, Central Asia, in the Southeast Asia, Middle East, and in Africa. Um, this is big stuff. I think in North America, few of us have really focused on the dimension of what that is. You know, we're already understand somewhat the shift in global economic balance of power as China has risen. Now think of that as another three billion people engage a similar process. Now, some of these countries are already rolling, right? India, I mentioned, Southeast Asia, 600 million people doing 5-6% growth, or 5-6% growth. Um, so it's not that they aren't already moving, but if you inject into that trillions of dollars of new high-quality infrastructure investment, that's going to catapult those countries over a decade to levels that I think few of us in terms of growth think about today, and that will have a huge impact on the world economy. Great opportunity, but you have to engage it. So you in Vancouver, you understand that engagement more than perhaps the rest of the country, and you have a big role to play, I think, in not only now, but in your careers of helping others understand that and being part of that. I, Jack, I've talked already a, a long time. Um, I could on. listen for hours. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess the Q&A is required. Uh, I'd love to do Q&A. I'd like to hear what you think. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, thank you for your uh, amazing insights and stuff. I just wanted to sort of peel back. So I'm assuming you travel with Azeem Pramji. Uh, so, yeah, I used to report into him, he's an amazing visionary. Um, my question to you is, um, can't hear I don't know if this is. Um, so I've also had the good fortune to work with uh, Dominic Barton. So I want to kind of launch and peel back a little bit on some of your China and India comments. Um, it, my analysis of India is, is actually where China was about 20 years ago. So it's their momentum in building up the infrastructure and their economy has been very slow. But we as Canadians enter China far too late, uh, in my view, and we're looking at repeating the same mistake in going into India and the opportunities it presents. So I'd just love to hear your thoughts on that. In our commodity business, a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to meet with the management and top management a company called SinoBrain. Is anyone in the room from SinoBrain? Um, it's the world's biggest buyer of grain oil seeds. And 
has large responsibility for feeding Chinese people, basically. And we talked, and <clears throat> at some point, uh, the CEO said to me, how is he going to come? How did a guy from Goldman Sachs get involved in commodity trading? about commodities. I was a kid, I thought about commodities at Goldman. I did a lot of work in the commodity sector. Um, it is the oldest business in the world. And by the way, I come from Canada, which is, you know, so I must have commodity in my blood I said, you're Canadian. Why? Well, I, never, I never thought of that. Uh, I want to show you something. So he got up in the middle of the dinner, the big round table, got up and took me. So I want to show you the Alvin Hamilton room. Does anyone in the room know who Alvin Hamilton is? Alvin Hamilton was a member of parliament in this country. Elected Jack, I think, in 1956 for the first time. Yes, sir. Close to that. Yeah. And became Minister of Agriculture. Um, and um, in 1957. Yes, it is. And um, in 1960, when China had this huge famine, partly self-induced, um, the U.S. still had a blockade on any form of trade with China. <clears throat> uh, and Hamilton said, the hell is the U.S. blockade? That's their business, not our business. And he started, we started selling meat to China. So, we actually have been there for a long time. <clears throat> but with <clears throat> China, you have to have consistency. And I would argue over the last over the decade through to 2015, through much of that period, we did not have consistency. This way, it was that way, it was forward, it was backwards, it was, I don't know, we're going to have an economic relation, a political relation, we're going to have all kinds. <clears throat> so China lost confidence in us, to be very frank. And other countries are sitting there saying, my God, it's not amazing, the Canadians are getting out of the game. So the Australians, the Americans, everyone else took advantage. Um, and so we moved backwards. The great work that Jack Lossky did over decades to build our relationship with China. Do you realize, for example, that Hu Jintao, spent, and John, if you'll correct me on this, but almost 10 days in Canada. And... September, yeah. in September of uh, Yeah. Um, and I don't think the President of China spent 10 days in any other country ever. I mean, and then we had a change in government, and all of a sudden... <laughs> China now. <laughs> so, we pay for this. And it's going to take some time to rebuild that relationship. Number two, the China of today is not the China of 20 years ago. It's, as we discussed, you know, in 1995, the Canadian economy was bigger than China. Today, what, China's six, six and a half times bigger. Number three, it's no longer enough to engage China, qua China, China as China. We have to engage China in the world. Take the one belt, one road project. Do we have infrastructure companies in Canada of scale? of sufficient scale that they can play in that league. If we don't, why don't we use our own infrastructure bank to help create them and then push them into that league? Um, the question of investment. Uh, so I think we did start early in China, um, but we have to put much more on this. Now, with regard to India, it's slightly different, right? Um, India has still a, a quickly expanding population. Uh, there are literacy issues in, in, in India. There are women's education issues that you don't find in China. So the ability of India to become <coughs> a major player on the world economy, I think is slightly different. It may come, but for now, India's economy is essentially driven internally. It's domestic demand economy. Savings rates much lower than China, the investment rate is, is lower. It's also some form of capitalist economy, some form. And, and China has no delusion. They, it's a demand economy with some capitalist characteristics, and they are 
trying to fool anybody by saying it's anything else. Um, also, I would argue that China, and India is much more diverse and has a more complex government system, which um, may, makes it problematic. I would say also both countries are probably equally corrupt. Um, but in China, the corruption, uh, in, in India, the corruption, I can say, is more democratic. <laughs> um, the great advantage of India is that uh, at a certain level in the economy, you can speak English. Um, so that makes things, things easier. So I see these two countries as quite different. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't have the, we shouldn't be pushing really hard on both. And also pushing hard on Japan. I think, you know, you guys all, you people all business in finance. If you have a company that has 80% of its sales to one client, you know that company, that company's going to be in trouble at some point. Right? That's, our, that's our situation. We have 82% of our sales to one client. And you can't walk on one leg. So we have to develop a, a second leg. And that second leg is pretty obvious where it has to be. It's in the part of the world where you have huge markets that are going to be growing very quickly. And we're lucky because we have so much immigration from those parts of the world. If somehow we can mobilize the immigrants from those uh, regions to be the spearhead of our development of those relations, that would be great. So that's how I would address your, your question. Yeah. yeah. Do you um, need the microphone? Or not? <laughs> so, like you said, um, obviously China is going to have a significant influence in the world because money talks and they are growing um, at the peak 40 percent, 45 percent of world growth. Um, and you also said earlier that China is not going to change, right? China is not going to change in terms of how they, uh, you know, the, their, the way they do business and and how they treat the people. Um, so I'm concerned is, uh, on one hand, I think we all like growth, but on the other hand, in the Western world, uh, we also value uh, our democratic institutions, our individual rights. So do you think, um, when the time goes on, will China more moving towards, other than the economic side, but in terms of democratic side, are they moving towards more democratic? Uh, kind of way of doing business, or they continue with their ways in the long term. Because that will have also impact our quality of life too, right? Uh, not only we have money, we also, I think, as Westerners, uh, we value the uh, individual freedoms and our democratic institutions. By the way, I'm originally from Manning China, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> when I say, when I said, China is going to be it didn't mean it literally won't change the investment in China today, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 40 years ago. And when China's a Confucian, what I meant was China's a Confucian society, like Japan and Korea, Taiwan, in which the state has always been important. Reference to the state. Uh, where hierarchy has a different legitimacy than it does in in this country, for example. So, whereas we might, uh, for example, when Jack was in government, they did a lot of what I thought were very positive, took a lot of very positive initiatives to promote the development of Canadian controlled businesses through, for example, the National Energy Plan. That was using the state, which is a, the state for us is an institute, an institution of social progress, right? Um, and they were using the state to develop the Canadian economy, so it was more Canadian focused, if I can put it that way. But a lot of people thought that was illegitimate. The politics shouldn't be, the state shouldn't be doing that, particularly our friends in America. And, and people very close to how they think in, in the oil patch and elsewhere. We've never had that debate in China um, or Japan. 
or Korea or Taiwan. Um, so that's what I, I, I there, you know, everything has a context. Um, so the second part of your question, I was in a, a meeting of more than a thousand Chinese CEOs, and the Prime Minister was uh, came to make a 15 minutes speech. Was televised live on national television. He spoke for 15 minutes. Then he said, "Are there any questions?" And he was sort of stunned and asked questions. And, then one guy, guy got up and said, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, I have a question. You're saying we should always be more productive. Uh, we have to create a better quality economy. You know, Prime Minister, people are always more productive when they're more relaxed and more satisfied. So I want to ask you, what are we going to do to promote the sexual revolution? And silence in the room, you should imagine. Um, and, the prime, and the Prime Minister snapped back. He said, This isn't the time or the place for that question. The guy got right back up. He said, Prime Minister, I have a different view. Here we have a thousand people who make big decisions for the country, and this is a program live on national television, so everyone's watching. And everyone wants to know the answer. Here's your opportunity. <laughs> Prime Minister snapped back. He was really surprised. He said, um, I'm too old for that question. <laughs> the guy got back up again. He said, you know, it, Mr. Prime Minister, it's only a question of the state of mind. Maybe you should think more about this for yourself as well. <laughs> um, you may, can you see someone asking uh, Stephen Harper this question? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone say yes? Um, or George Bush? No, Donald Trump, yeah, he, he may have <laughs> He tweet for a week or whatever. Um, so what I, I mean to say is that, and he wasn't picked up by men in green raincoats, and um, he said he had a chain of stores called Eros, E-R-O-S. He said, for adult education. Um, he went up later and gave his card to the Prime Minister. Um, and last time I was in Beijing, I saw there's still some Arab stores around, so somehow he's still in business. Um, what I mean to say is that there's a lot, there's progress at first. It's not occurring uh, in a straight line. It's not occurring in every sphere. Um, but I'm somewhat simple-minded. And I think that if every day we are called on to make more decisions ourselves about where we're going to live, about where we're going to work, about what we do, buy and sell, where our kids, how we be educated, kids, all these decisions, that adds up. And I would say that the sphere in China where people don't have the right to make the decision is smaller today than it's been at any time, I wouldn't say just since the revolution of 1949, I would say for many centuries beforehand. Um, so that's how I would express it. Are there problems in China? Yeah, I, I can talk to you three hours about problems. But I would see it in this historical context and in the cultural context. So I would answer that I'm relatively hopeful that that trend can continue. And part of continuing that trend, I think, is very positive engagement with China in an open and respectful manner. Yes? I'm curious because you touched upon NAFTA. And I understand what you're saying also in terms of the relationship with China, especially in the investment capacity. But going forward, especially currently right now, we're seeing a radical change on the on how nations approach free trade. Of course, with the U.S. right now and how they're approaching, approaching NAFTA as well as demanding bilateral bilateral arrangements as well as renegotiation of trades like with the, with South Korea and also Brexit. But 
Canada right now is facing, is facing some, some choices. A deal with China would take years. They are severely engaging, as you pointed out. How do you see these, how do you see these other arrangements working out there? Because of course we have the TPP arrangement going on. The Asian region, the Asian and the East Asia region is working on the RCEP. Uh, how, do you, how do you see the direction going and the energy uh, for, for the Canadian government going towards, the, towards these other agreements uh, as, and as you say, to try to diversify our options? Um, well, the, the deal with Europe is in place. <clears throat> There's only so much you can negotiate at one time, right? You have, a, you have endless um, capacity to negotiate. So I think the government at the moment is pretty much focused on NAFTA. Uh, I think the Americans want to wrap up the NAFTA negotiation well before we get into the electoral period in Mexico. So they want to wrap it up within the first two, even late first quarter next year. So that tells me it's not going to be picking this thing up by the roots and really restructuring. It's going to be a, a refreshing of that. Uh, Trump, I think, his bark is worse than his bite. Um, <clears throat> and whatever the results of the negotiation, it will be the most beautiful deal ever. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think we should just get on our way and start working on, uh, on a deal with China. I think, um, can TPP exist now without China, without the US? Well, since TPP fell through, Thailand's uh, cut a deal with China, Malaysia's cut a deal with China, <coughs> they're all negotiating, Philippines has cut a deal with China. And all these countries now are involved with China, as you mentioned, negotiating the regional trade agreement. I, I just wonder if TPP uh, really reemerges. It is, it's, it is uh, possibly emerging. Uh, it, it, it is. I understand that, but I just wonder what will really happen in the end. Um, so we're a small country, relatively. We need these agreements. We need international institutions to be strong and function. Uh, because if not, the world is left to the strongest. And we get trampled. Right? So it's in our great interest to be really fully engaged as a middle power in all of these areas, both building the strength and capacity of international institutions and also putting in place agreements uh, that can promote and then subsequently protect our interests. That's how I would answer. Now, yeah, there, we saw in the German elections on the weekend, as we saw in the UK, Five Star Movement is currently meeting in the polls in Italy. <clears throat> we see in Hungary, in Poland, uh, a reaction against further integration. Um, and I think that reaction can become larger if you overlay the technological change that I mentioned earlier. The studies indicate that of the job displacement over the last 20 years, about 80% of it has come from technology and 20% from trade, but if you listen to many politicians, it's 120% from trade. Uh, I, when I met with the elected uh, before he had become president, uh, Trump, last November, his team had statistics and a view of China that was dated from, I'd say, 2005. And that's what they were fighting. Um, and I think. It's easy to, and it happens all the time, right? Somebody else is the, the reason for our problems. I think we have to build our economy, make it much more resilient, <coughs> emphasize education, education, <coughs> uh, investment in infrastructure, get headquarters companies as, as much as we can here, and think of what our own interests are. And you know, the Americans weren't always be happy. They weren't happy with all the <coughs> They weren't happy with Pierre Trudeau when uh, with Jack uh, in the late 
late 1960s and early 70s, we worked to develop our relationship with China. Um, it was the right thing to do. And it will be the right thing to do now. Thanks, Ken. Uh, I know you have to take a break uh, at 9 o'clock, and uh, so, Sue here, thank you. Uh, good morning, I'm Sudhir Gupta, the director of the Jack Austin, uh, Jack Austin Center. On behalf of the Center, uh, the Green School of Business and Science for the University, uh, let me thank you for coming out, and a special thanks to Ken for sharing his word of wisdom. I'm, I'm sure you're, you can eager to get back and adjust your portfolios. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> just thank, uh, it's a small gift. Thank you. Thank you.